What's going on? What's crackalacking? My peoples, my peoples, welcome to a special edition of This Is Happening. Today, we're visiting different spots in the community to have what we call restaurant chats. Um, it's my belief that culture is made by culture makers, and that, of course, includes artists, food makers, educators, and many others and everyone has a voice. So it's important we get out in the community and talk to a range of folks, how they operate in the world politically, what their art, their life is about. And I'm so happy today that we're starting the series right here in Los Angeles on Jefferson at Revolutionario North African Tacos. So happy to be here with one of the owners, Susan, how you doing? Welcome Hi. to the show. And, I'm doing great. And, uh, and also joining us um, is one of KPFK's host, Nana Jamfi, attorney, activist, host, educator, and bon vivant. <laughs> <laughs> I like the bon vivant part. I'm very, very pleased to be here. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much for being Thank here. You. Thank you. Thank you for letting us in your home. Thank it's you. It's wonderful to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. So um, we're just going to have a conversation, and uh, um, your, your husband, Chef Zaid, mm -hmm. is going to... Um, be bringing out some food at various points and as we talk and we'll do that um, before we get started the political session I do want to talk a little bit about the food just just in terms of tell us about the taco fixings bar can you describe the fullness of that our taco toppings are based on North African cuisine and and North West Africans actually it's very it's not just North Africa North Africa is really part of like North West Africa and um, we wanted to make we wanted to use the term African because um, you know just Africanness and blackness in general globally is erased. And when people talk about historians talk about the Moors ruling um, Andalusia for seven hundred some years, they're always phrased as Arabs, but they're, they're they were Arabized peoples genetically. They were Northwest Africans, and a lot of them were black. And we we. Are very proud of that. I mean, it is, it's a global culture. Right. Northwest Africa was like kind of you know an international super highway for so many different influences, and we want to we want to like by including Africa, Africa, Africa in the name. We want to pe people to realize that you know Africa has it, it's not static. I think people think of Af in the West people think of Africa as static, like it was, nothing has changed in thousands of years. But you know it's a dynamic, alive culture and the food culture is alive and um, globally speaking there are a lot of influences since Northwest Africa influenced Spanish cooking and Spanish agriculture and so many Spanish cultural elements when the Spaniards and, and you know southern Mediterranean people set sail for the Americas they brought that culture with them so we do have a lot of Latin American customers Mexican customers in particular who are aware of that historical bond yeah, that's great um, and one of my favorites, I have a couple favorites, but I love the pickled onions and also the pineapple kimchi. Mm -hmm. uh, I hate to sound like, you know, some nerd from New York who doesn't <laughs> understand either Korean or African cooking because I don't, but I know the food that I love, and I love your pineapple kimchi. What are some of the other things that you do that, um, uh, what are the flavors represented in your taco fixings? Well, the, the pineapple kimchi and then the regular kimchi, it's basically just, it's Salvadoran cortito, and then I added pineapple to one of them. They're not even really kimchi, but I know that's what people will like. So sometimes I just name things to see what kind of reaction I'll get. And so people like that, you know, I am of Korean heritage and I'm making kimchi, which isn't even real kimchi, but people will swear up and down that it's real kimchi. So I like to do like kind of my own social experiments with like what has currency or not and what people think is authentic or not. So basically, if, if people read you as an authentic person, they'll, think, they'll believe that what you do is authentic. And in a way, it is authentic, you know. Um, let me ask. And then like the onions, escabash, that's, that's something you'll find in a lot of um, Latin American restaurants too, and that is a North African influence in Spanish cooking that was brought over to Latin America. So that's pretty straightforward. And then the other toppings, we do, you know, pickled radish, pickled um, carrots, that's very North, North Africans pickle a lot too. Right. And then the different sauces, we do um, a red harissa which is a traditional Algerian and uh, Tunisian hot sauce made from dried red chilies, oranges, spices, peppers. And then we do a green harissa, which is basically, it's very similar to a, um, a Mexican agua chile for um, ceviches. But, you know, and that's also similar to a shermula. There are lots of food cultures in the world that make like a spicy green herb hot sauce. And then we do a garlic yogurt sauce just because it, it tastes good. Right. Something, you know, it just tastes good. 
and then we do a pineapple chutney, pineapple salsa, because we like to address like what our customers ask for and our like different demographics. And our customers are really diverse, but because we are close to USC and there's a lot of Indian international students and little Bangladesh is like in the middle of Koreatown, which is just north of us, we do get a lot of South um, Asian customers. And it just made sense. It's like, I, I know they'll like it. I know the rest of our customers will like it. You know, it's, it's, it's a little sweet. It's a, like, like a spicy ketchup. Right. Um, what, tell us a little bit about how Revolutionary got started. How did you pick this place and where do you see your location in terms of the the trends of um, of the LA demographics, the diaspora, restaurant culture. Where do you see your uh, your family's restaurant um, fitting into the current LA food and political landscape? I picked this location. Um, I found it on Craigslist. The rent was really cheap. <laughs> right. And I knew exactly where it was. It's a very crossroady neighborhood. So basically, we're on the northern end of South Central LA, which you know, LA City voted to call it South LA a few years ago. It's still South Central LA, and then it's also um, part of West Adams. And when I first opened, um, various members of like different kinds of communities that live here, they all came to tell me like, what this neighborhood. Do you know where you are? Do you know where you are? Not one person mentioned to me that this block is also historic old Koreatown. The oldest Korean American Presbyterian church is there. And um, I'm not particularly tied to a Korean customer base. I didn't grow up in Koreatown. So that wasn't like, that's not the reason I came here. But it is on the, you know, the northern end of South Central LA. We wanted to, you know, bring our North Africanness here. And it's also very crossroady. And we are a mixed family. We're, a, you know, multicultural mixed family. We're polyglots. Um, I'm kind of a half ass polyglot. Um, <laughs> And you know, this is like the Byzantine Quarter, the Greek Byzantine Quarter. This, uh, we're close to the Salvadoran Corridor. Um, well, and your husband, uh, Chef Zaid, mm -hmm. is a uh, uh, French Algerian. Uh, yeah. And he was born in France, and his parents are Algerian Berbers, and Berbers are the indigenous people of North Africa. Right. And like the whole entire northern cap from Egypt to Morocco, and then like. The, the, the southern part underneath, they, they influence all of that. And he actually did have a DNA test done, and it's basically the one third of North of Africa, a top half. Right. Yeah, so, so his like DNA is a story of where Berbers were. So I didn't mean to interrupt okay. your flow no, no, about the, the neighborhood. Oh, so the neighborhood, yeah, and then there's, um, you know, we get a lot of support from Jewish customers too, halal food. And I hear that from a lot of halal restaurant owners. And, you know, we're like close to mid city. And so I just, I just felt like everybody would come here, and everybody did. Right. And it's a very, very sleepy stretch of Jefferson. There's no foot traffic, so we have to constantly market. We have, we've been here for almost three years. We have no signs on the outside of the building. We have no visibility. Oh so my it's just God, you're, good, you're the coolest of the cool. Just, the, just like goodwill and word of mouth, and you know, and it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a struggle at times because we just have to constantly right. talk about ourselves, right. and so do our customers. You know? right. um, what do you see as some of the challenges? Um, uh, living and working in this community? What are some of the uh, challenges the community faces in addition to what you face? I think really, you know, this community, we're fine on our own. The big threat really is gentrification. And um, that all started when, when I, you know, enrollment at higher education was just peaking and peaking and growing and growing because of millennials. Um, and USC didn't didn't have enough student housing, so student housing started bleeding over into like this neighborhood, this part, you know, further um, west of USC. And so a lot of single family homes were sold and they were converted to like student housing. Now, last fall, USC um, added 35% uh, more student housing. So they solved the student housing crisis. But what gentrifiers and developers don't utilize in their algorithms is that information isn't available in their algorithms yet. So they're late to the game in trying to buy up this block for student housing. They're just late. But they don't care because they're playing with synthetic, fictitious, elastic capital. They don't care. And so that's like the biggest threat, gentrification. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's displacing families. It's, it's threatened to displace my business. Um, a developer was planning on buying it and he wanted to raise my rent. Uh, double without adding any amenities. So basically, as a woman of color, you know, I'm not Hispanic, I'm not black, but I, I still am a woman of color in the sense that I'm not white either. Right. So I don't benefit from um, 
gentrification in the same way white people do. And I, I get pushed around and about. So another person's buying this building. He does want to raise my rent. He does want to raise, you know, but he's going to upgrade and, and um, give us more amenities for raising our rent. And his rent increase isn't nearly as much. But what gentrification does, you know, it's, it's just going to be, I have to make, for every thousand dollars that my rent goes up, I have to make, I have to do 5,000 more in sales just to cover that. It's not, from a, you know, landlord's point of view, they think it's just a thousand dollars. It's not. It's a lot. So if you take a family of five, let's say four working adults, and they, they rent a house here, um, and, and the rent is raised by $500, that's $500 they may not even have, so they can be evicted. And that's the biggest threat, gentrification. Right. Um, Nana, you are a, a community uh, activist, you're an attorney, you're deeply connected to many of the, uh, the struggles of working class folks um, throughout Los Angeles. Uh, in terms of what Susan has shared with us uh, about um, what she sees as the effects of gentrification, w how does that uh, align, or does it align with your view from where you're sitting as an, as an attorney, activist, and radio um, host? What do you see as the trends of gentrification affecting Los Angeles communities right now? I mean, what we have really is just a, the re-colonialization of the area. That's really what it is. When you look at colonialism in its you know, purest form, what it brings in terms of white supremacy, racism, what it brings in terms of capitalism, what it brings in terms of patriarchy. And people might think, well, how does patriarchy fit in? But as you're talking about, as a woman of color, when we look at the neighborhoods that are being gentrified, most of the people that are living in those neighborhoods are women of color and their children. Mm -hmm. Right? These are the, and that's the household, right? The majority of the households look like that. And it's definitely a part of the thinking of these developers. Who are they pushing out, right? If they thought they were pushing out some, you know, brothers and others that were packed and ready to deal, they may not have that same response. But they figure that they're pushing out folks who are immigrants, um, not just, of course, brown immigrants, but black immigrants, Asian immigrants. They figure that they're picking, pick, pushing out women. Um, they figure that they're pushing out folks who are gender non-conforming, femmes, trans. This is who they see in the communities, and those are the communities that they've been attacking first. And so when you look at SC, when, and you look at these buildings as you're driving by, who was living there, mm -hmm. right? And we know that it wasn't white students with the funds to pay for SC. Mm -hmm. It was working class families who were putting many people into their apartments to be able to afford that rent, right? And so when it's clear that from a political perspective, it represents a colonization because it is not the people who live here who are making the decisions about what this neighborhood looks like, about what is developed, that it is clearly the developers and their money that is driving it just like you know, the queen of Spain's money <laughs> and the, the, the royalty of Portugal and of Britain was driving colonization, right? And then economically, we see that they look at our neighborhoods as just resource and in particular land, uh -huh. right? And land is always the greatest resource as our brother El Haj Malik El Shabazz Malcolm X, can, you know, taught us. And so they look at the land aspect, they look at the labor aspect, mm -hmm. right, in terms of us as people who can work on the properties or in the properties mm -hmm. or buy stuff, right, and be consumers once they take those properties over. Mm -hmm. And then we look at the cultural shift, right, which colonization also is a lot about the culture. What does it mean to live in a neighborhood? What's a good neighborhood? What's a safe neighborhood, right, as defined by them? Mm -hmm. So safety becomes what causes Stefan Clark to be murdered, right? Stacy becomes, mm -hmm. what is it, next door neighbor, whatever that little yeah, that, that, app where, is or yeah. whatever, where they say- I saw oh. somebody suspicious. <laughs> right, you know, oh, there's this man selling- It's uh, called Sketchy Blacks. Yeah, you know. That's, well, what, that's what the app should be called because exactly. that's effectively and sketchy racist, sketchy getting, blacks. Yeah. Exactly, people end up getting murdered in their own backyard, mm -hmm. right? But that, that's how this is happening. I think I shared with you once, Jerry, that I had to stop the police from harassing a brother who was literally running for the bus mm -hmm. because a young white man was standing at the bus stop and he just knew mm -hmm. that that brother was running towards him in order to harm him in some way. And the police actually stopped and entertained this foolishness. Like I had to tell the cop, come on, 
the brother's running from the bus. And I had to tell the, the white guy, mm -hmm. you realize that you're on Crenshaw. It's yeah. a Crenshaw policy. You're on Crenshaw, you're gonna see black people running for the bus. So if that's gonna frighten you, you need to yeah. not live here because you make us unsafe. And that is a, a piece that I think we really need to get across to the um, young white folks mm -hmm. who are coming into the, our neighborhoods that you are making us unsafe. Mortally so. Yes. You know, we risk death because of your presence. Mm -hmm. You are impoverishing us. Right? We lose because of income because of your presence. And you are uh, uh, disenfranchising us. Mm -hmm. Because when you come in and we get pushed out, then how do we get our representatives in office? How do we begin to be represented on the political sphere? We can't, and we see we can't that run happening. for a bus yeah. without a death threat. <laughs> right. How can we right. overcome the yeah. the entrenched power of the politics of white supremacy, while folks that are benefiting from it are sometimes wholly unaware of their impact, and they're just following the rules, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm a nice white guy, I'm a nice person, I, I've moved to this neighbor and I like it, but I'm really shook if I see a black guy running for the bus. Yeah. And not realizing the disconnect between that reaction and the danger you pose to the neighborhood. Like, it, And the only people who can not appreciate that reaction mm -hmm. are people who haven't paid the cost of white supremacy. Because right. anyone who's paid that cost knows no. exactly yeah. what right. that danger is. Right. And to expand on your colonialization motif, I mean, it's very deliberate, okay? Mm. This is how white people move into neighborhoods like this. They typically start buying up a block, and they make sure they buy up a block, and it's all with real estate agents, too. And they make right. sure to buy up a block that can be turned into a historic overlay zone. And then they start, you know, pressuring um, other uh, um, homeowners on the block to sell. You're going to get a lot of money. You're going to get a lot of money. You can still move and they create their little island space. And then if you look at the mixed-use commercial um, residential mm. developments that are, mm. that are gonna be built near Crenshaw or whatever, you know, it's close to public transportation. Right. And also they're telling you, you know, come and live in an island space. So not only are you like, you know, it, it's, it's, they set up the conditions where they're gonna be embattled against the neighborhood. Right. Take resources from the neighborhood, but not shop in the neighborhood. They're not gonna go to the neighborhood hair salon. They're not right. gonna go to the neighborhood barber shop. Right. They're not going to go to El Rey Market across the street. So they, they want to they're import not, other want to like yeah. big brand businesses uh -huh. that they're familiar and comfortable with to displace the local businesses. Oh, yeah. You're yeah. going to look up, as we say, you look okay. up, you see yoga on this side, mm -hmm. the cafe place on this side, your neighborhood is gone. Yeah. You look, you know, they'll eat up your neighborhood like a lawnmower eats grass. And this is stuff you just see. You know, they have next the Nextdoor app. Yes. <laughs> And all these Facebook um, pages, it's like, oh, there's just so much noise in this neighborhood. And it's like, that's why you got that house for cheap. Right. <laughs> what, 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 you know, and, and it's like, really, are people of color the only people who make noise at night? No, right. no. Right. The, uh, my, my neighbors uh, and I have a pact uh, because I, I live in the Hollywood Hills and most of my neighbors are white. There's another black guy, uh, mm -hmm. but we can't have a third. Uh, and uh, that would just hit yeah, the would, demographic. We got the letters from our white neighbors. They're like, three is too many. We're being tolerant. There's two of you in the building. So uh, I think that one of the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm completely distracted by this beautiful dog outside. I completely lost my train of thought. I've got a thing for dogs. Jerry likes dogs. I this dog. So um, I think that one of, the, one of the things that happens is that people not only don't recognize the displacement that they're doing, but they bring their vision of what their new neighborhood should be with them. Yes. And you can point to, you know, there's thousands of hideous examples and some of the more uh, persistent ones that became viral. I remember uh, the story of this woman in uh, Prospect Park in mm -hmm. Brooklyn just about three, four years ago. And uh, there's uh, these uh, vendors that sell uh, usually or frequently, um, mm -hmm. uh, traditionally and historically, um, Puerto Rican uh, men. They tend to be older and they sell paracos, uh, these yeah. ices, yeah. and they're flavored. The kids love it, whatever. And, you know, back in the day, they used to also have rum for the adults. <laughs> so, New York in the 70s. That like <laughs> so, <laughs> right, exactly. So, uh, well, no, you <laughs> right, it, it's hey, he right. He put it in there himself. It was great. Come on. <laughs> You had a concert in the park, you have your drink. It was, you know, the 70s were great when you were 10 and drinking rum in the park. So uh, in any event, this moment, this 
new young homeowner is there with her three-year-old. The three-year-old wants paracas and is saying, oh, well, give me... The mom says no. The kid has a complete meltdown. And I want to... So the mother goes out on this political rant engaging all the resources that she can to stop there being any paracqua sales in, she, in Prospect Park. Yeah, right, right, because she doesn't, want child. she doesn't want to deal with the child. So the solution is to destroy this element of local culture that has existed for decades and to destroy this man's livelihood because she I'm here now yeah. and I own this building, so F you. And, and it's that level, and that as hideous as that disconnect is, it is entirely indicative and aligned with the series of disconnects that come with people who show up in neighborhoods, whatever the neighborhood is, and be like, I'm here now and here's how it's going to change. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that part of that, though, you know, I don't, I don't know how much that is not something that they know in terms of the attitude that they have, right? Because that's also part of, uh, you know, colonialism. You say mm -hmm. to people, you know what, you don't deserve this land. Mm -hmm. You don't deserve this place because you don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. You indigenous people, you're here and you're just living off the land like squirrel and rabbits. I mean, this is literally what John yeah. Adams, when we're in law school, you read the Federalist Papers and they literally mm -hmm. lay it out. You're not, you don't know what to do with this place. You should be chopping all these trees. You mm -hmm. should be doing something with this water. You should be taking all this gold and making Their yourself aboriginal rich. rights mm -hmm. are just for occupancy. But that's exactly, exactly the exactly. language they use when yes. they talk about you know, gentrifying. It's yes. like, oh, these people look at all that trash. They don't know how to beautify their neighborhoods. They have no understanding that you know, city services are reduced to right. lower income neighborhoods. Right. Right. You know, you know, they, they don't like nice things. And it's not up to the renters. Right. It's it's uh, it's the landlords. The building right. owners are supposed to beautify, but they don't. Right. Yeah. The, the city politicians are supposed to make the alleys clean. Mm -hmm. Pe people are actually doing more to keep their alleys clean than the city is. Yeah. In, people in buildings in neighborhoods are saying, "Look, this is too much," and they are. We are organizing events. Yeah. Say, come on, neighborhood, block club, or mm -hmm. whatever, let's clear out this thing. Because people are waiting, complaining, filing things, and the city just doesn't yeah. respond. Mm -hmm. Period. You animals die, they just lay there. Yeah. Until they are, you know, barely anything more than bone. It's not because people in our community are, don't realize that it mm -hmm. smells, it doesn't look good, there should be more dignity for this animal than that, but they don't respond when you call. Yeah. And gentrifiers don't know that. They blame systemic right. problems on the residents themselves. They blame the problems of vulture white supremacist capitalism yeah. on, on the renters themselves. So they, it makes them feel good, like they have a right. halo. But we're going to clean up everything. We're going we're gonna to beautify. That's right. a historic building. Well, you, you know, you, you just don't appreciate it. And they don't understand that what they're doing is the same thing that their parents did and their grandparents did when they took over for the suburbs. Right. And they still benefit, white people still benefit from preferential loans and lower interest loans, loans at all. Right. I guess in many ways it shouldn't be surprising in as much as there's obviously a deep historical link. This is, this is the process. This is mm -hmm. the process, as you said, whether it's colonization um, and uh, gentrification is definitively linked to that in as much as um, colonization is the uh, initial, like, essential form of gentrification. We are having this conversation on Tongva land, mm -hmm. and the and uh, once that first theft happened, there's just been a continuous series of, of other thefts, and our organized, purposeful disconnect from the initiation of this process of thefts and not connecting it to this moment mm -hmm. is one of the reasons that the the forces that are interested in continuing this horrific capitalist turnover and oppression, it's one of the reasons that they are able to retain their power mm -hmm. because we look at ourselves and our struggles as a point and a moment in terms of isolation mm -hmm. more often than not. Not always. Sometimes we be woke and we realize we have real connections we can make with others and this is how we make it better. But what what we're encouraged to believe is that the world we are living in is our fault. Right. Any any absence of success in our lives, whether it be health care for our children or being able to make your rent is again your fault and your personal failing that you're not connected to the Tongva nation that was mm -hmm. displaced that you're not connected to the millions of people that came before you and the millions of people that will come after. And there's an inherent strength, I think, in the realization mm -hmm. of the power of our connection. But that is curated out of us. Yeah. Right. And I think when, when we're talking in that vein, when you look at the solutions that are allegedly laid out there, right? Because gentrification is causing this increased houselessness. Mm -hmm. Everyone may not be on the sidewalk. You know, a mm -hmm. lot of people were in their cars. A lot of people are on people's couches for a minute, and people's garages for a minute. Um, but when you look at 
how that is happening and the solutions that the city and other sort of nonprofits and others come up with, the solutions always assume that there's a pathology or that there's something wrong with the person. Yeah. So it's like, okay, we can help you. Mm -hmm. now there's, but you've got to go through all this counseling. Yeah. You know, if you go into short term, if we can provide short term housing, but you got to be in by 9 p.m. Now, this person didn't do anything, right. yeah, but suddenly yeah. they got like halfway yeah. house rules. And it's right. You can't have people come over and you can't do this and you can't do that. So suddenly you're it, the solution is that you're going to help to do this behavior modification. Yeah. Right, which we know is their solution to everything. You know what's happening in the schools. They're trying to help our children to the, know how to behave. Just right, act a little bit differently. It will be better. Right, and and this yeah. is the standard of that. And you can't quite get there, you know. Mm -hmm. But we'll still see if what we can do to to put the monkey in a suit and see if it can kind and of work out. It starts with prenatal care, and it mm -hmm. starts at birth and early childhood education. Mm -hmm. I remember when we first opened here, I saw a sign. It was for, um, you know low-income toddlers and nursery school age children it was like you know it's it, um and clearly it was not like created by somebody in the community <laughs> because these children were described as like you know high risk and i'm like they're just babies i mean <laughs> what are they at high risk for except like sis, mostly like systemic things exactly. right exactly i mean and, and, yeah, yeah, been, and, and they want to teach these yes yeah. they want to <laughs> teach babies from the point of view that they 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 are traumatized by being high risk right. <laughs> From the beginning, it's like you're def you're you know deficient, yeah. and that again gives the idea to folks that these neighborhoods are being improved, and gives a, a space or a platform for our own people to say that, yeah, right, and because that's where the class issue comes in, right? Mm -hmm. For people to say, black people who have man who are one step, I always tell them, you're one step away from South Central. And mm -hmm. your other step away from Mississippi. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. literally, mm -hmm. one step away from each. One foot mm -hmm. in Mississippi. And some of you, you don't even got the Mississippi. You just one step from Africa, right? right? <laughs> um, but this idea that you can now, because you've moved into this other place, look your nose down. Okay, but now explain the gentrification of Baldwin Hills. Mm -hmm. Explain the gentrification of View Park. Those neighborhoods look fabulous. And the Mert. Those and the Mert. Those and neighborhoods look clean. Those neighborhoods look mm -hmm. right. So. So what's the problem there, right? You can't use the same type of pathological descriptions mm -hmm. of black folks and other folks of color in the hood uh, when you're describing mm -hmm. their situation, and yet the gentrification is still happening. Mm -hmm. So it clearly has nothing to do with the fault or the deficiencies mm -hmm. of folks in terms of economics, et cetera, and clearly it's just based upon the typical issues that colonialism placed upon, mm -hmm. race, economics, uh, gender, mm -hmm. and how those define power. Right. One of the things that I really love about living in Los Angeles is that in addition to this kind of petri dish that we live in, in terms of structured oppression and structural oppression, that we're trying to transit through and get on with our lives and embrace the good things that we like, um, in addition to all that, that struggle, that necessary struggle that I'm happy to engage in, there's a tremendous amount of beauty in Los Angeles, and there's a tremendous amount of cultural beauty in Los Angeles. And, uh, and some of that cultural beauty um, comes from spaces that, like you have built and created with your family, like this space here. Um, I know that uh, when, uh, oh, Susan doesn't like talking about it, she won't mention it, but I will. Uh, when they first opened, they, uh, um, they had this uh, pay it for jar. Instead of tipping their staff, they would, people would just put money in a pay it for jar, and on Mondays, they would have a community meal for folks in the community who, who may not be able to afford to eat here otherwise. And um, it, you know, it was, uh, had its challenges because there's mental health issues in the community, et cetera. But the fact that restaurateurs um, move their small business into community and are thoughtful enough and caring enough about the community to make a space for and try to find creative ways to connect with the community because it, it's typically what people do is just throw their hands mm -hmm. up and say, oh, well, I can't be involved with that. I'm just here to, you know, yeah. push the, this masa. Type of way, <laughs> yeah. right? Right. That looking down type of way, like, we're going to bring you to Jesus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. We don't do any of that. Exactly. Here's your food, you know, you get utensils, a napkin, a bottle of cold water. Some people ask for a soda, that's fine. I, I'm not gonna say no sugar for you. you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes people need sugar, that's fine. Well, why did you, why was that an important 
element of y'all opening this restaurant, and why is it why is it an important element to you? Why do you think it's your responsibility it's to feed a, people that can't afford food? It's a cultural component, of, you know, heritage for both myself and my husband. You know, like North African Berbers, if somebody's hungry, you invite them into your home. Mm -hmm. And there's a strong Buddhist um, influence in Korean culture. Mm -hmm. My parents always said, if somebody's hungry, you have to feed them. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, it, it is your imperative to feed them. You have food, you have to feed them. So that's and and that's it. And then you know, and then I when once we started doing it, we realized we are making a larger point. You know, we we, we don't th you know they're just because somebody's homeless doesn't mean they are not a member of this community. They are still of this community. We have no desire to call the police on people. You know, homelessness is not a crime. Poverty is not a crime. Somebody who's victimized by the system since they were even born, before they were even born, that's not a criminal. So we don't want to do anything like that. And then in just welcoming people inside and say, here's food. You can come back anytime. Come back anytime you're hungry. Is, you know, it, it the onus is on us too. We have personal yeah. responsibility to help each other. Right. And I was going to say, you know, about culture makers and, and you know, cross fertilizations. You know, my parents are in their 70s. When they came to America, they were not having conversations like this. Mm -hmm. You know, they always taught us that you know to be believe in equality and things like that. But you know, you know, re relationships between people of color in Los Angeles or in America were not like evolved to that point. You know, they, they happened in like political spheres, like, right. you know, Yellow Peril and the Black right. Panthers talk, right. but not in everyday spaces. My generation, you know, I went to school in America, so it was just, we had conversations like this. I think my daughter's generation, she's Generation Z, 19, second year of college, they're much more further away. So when I see the protests compared to 1992, when people protest in, in South Central LA, and I participated in one, it's a mixed group right. protesting together. Right, 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 right. So, you know, people of color too. There, we do have elements among us that are, you know, that, that can turn the other way. We right. all know that too. Right. The oh, Ben yeah. Carsons. Oh yeah. <laughs> Stacy Dash. Right. Right. Nikki, whatever her name is. <laughs> Nikki Haley. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, absolutely. And, and I, the gentrifiers look for people. Like I that. was about to say. See, that falls into the conversation, right, mm -hmm. of the gentrifiers of this colonialism, mm -hmm. because part of what you do is that you make it appear to folks that there's this limited resource for them. Yeah. Right. White folks are not sitting around here thinking that they're limited in anything. Yeah. They're not thinking that, oh, there's only so many jobs that we're going to have. There's mm -hmm. only so much land that we're going to have. Generally speaking, we know that we yeah, have those, exactly those other about. folks, yeah. right, that, that are clear on the fact that they're being overrun and they want to do something about it, right? But generally, they don't have these conversations where they're like, oh my gosh, you know, we're going to run out of jobs. We're going to run out of space. We're going to run out, because they figure they just take it away from us, yeah. right? And just instill in us that, you, if the if the Koreans are on this block, that means you can't be on this block. So now you got to fight like hell to keep the Koreans off this block, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, even inter intra our communities, right? Mm -hmm. Folks saying, hey, you know, uh, <laughs> we've got to deal with these black immigrants that are coming from Africa and the Caribbean because somehow they're taking over or they're taking up this space that we should be taking, right? And I tell folks, I'm like, you know, that would eliminate Kwame Ture. Do you know what I'm saying? That would eliminate Marcus Garvey. That would eliminate Shirley Chisholm. Like, mm -hmm. think about what you're talking about and why you're saying this, because we didn't used to talk this way, yeah. right? Who's getting us to say that we're upset that my son is going to Howard, we're from Ghana, yeah. right? And, uh, and that somehow he's taking the space of a person who has 400 years of history, a black person yeah. in this country, when we really should be trying to find out why is Howard not getting the funding? Why are the HBCUs not getting the funding mm -hmm. they should get so that any black student uh, that wants to go to college has the capacity to go to college? Right. Yeah. You uh, nailed it. What, yeah. you all are um, business owners and mm -hmm. um, you have uh, large voices in mm -hmm. your communities and um, you're also mothers. Um, with children, uh, you know, teenagers in Los Angeles. Why are you raising your children in Los Angeles? And what I mean by that is, you know, because we've been, we spent a lot of time unpacking a lot of the, the hardships and we, you know, we didn't even get to them all. But there's also, there's something for some people beating at the core of this city that pulls them in and that keeps them here and that makes them want to have families and raise children here. What were some of the things that motivated you to raise your families in Los Angeles? 
I mean, for me, part of it was the work, right? The connection to the community. And so I, I would love to be in Ghana and have that same kind of connection at home. I don't have that connection at home because my parents took a Pan Am to come out here to the United States and to, you know, my father went to Berkeley. That's where he got his PhD in civil engineering. So that disconnect is there, right? And so we have to do these things like have family reunions and make the trip home, which is not cheap, right, to be able to reconnect. And for me, the capacity to know that I am not more than 20 minutes away from anywhere I want to be with my people and with those who are in community with my people is fabulous. I'm not more than 20 minutes away from here. That's what I want. I don't want to be out in the boondocks and have Come to take there. two hours to get here because then I'm not coming through here. Um, and I wanted my son to grow up in that. I wanted my son to not be like me. Again, I grew up in, my father worked for the World Bank. I grew up in a very white world other than living in Africa. And I didn't want my son to grow up in that world where you're the weirdo and you're strange and people are making comments about how your skirt fits on you, mm -hmm. you know, your kilt and people are making comments about your hair. I wanted him to be in a place where he was supported, where he is loved, where he is treated with respect, where people, and uh, you know, let him know that he has value. And that happens in this community. Mm -hmm. And this community, you mean South Central? South Central, yeah, that yeah. happens in South Central. What were some of the... the your thought, I mean, I know sometimes people don't plan, you know, like, oh, I'm gonna raise a family, we'll be in this state at this location. But right. what were, what made you embrace staying in Los Angeles to raise a family and have children? Well, like Nana, um, my parents made that choice for me. When I was five, they flew me over on, a, on Korean Air, Boeing 747, so I grew up in LA. And I've traveled quite a bit, not just internationally, but domestically. And I like L.A., and, and I raised my kids in different neighborhoods in L.A., but it was just never the right mix. And finally, we decided to just move to South Central L.A., and I like the mix here because um, it, it addresses, you know, all the heritages that my um, kids have. And my daughter likes it that she meets people on a regular basis, on a daily basis, who will identify her as Blasian or Afro-Asian. They just look at her and they know. Right. Whereas, like, in other neighborhoods, it's like people, most of the time, it's like, what are you? I have no idea. Right. Right. So she likes, she likes that. For, because to be mixed, and she is, you know, it's, it's, it's a relatively rare mix to be Korean and Algerian and Berber, and Berber right? <laughs> it's a rel and just to be around people who, like, I see you, I recognize you, it's a, it's a big deal to my daughter. And then just being, like, 20 minutes away from all of my friends, because this is very cross -roady. I think, you know, South Central LA is, is like, really in the media. If, if I read one more print article about, you know, drive-throughs and drive-bys, right, exactly. they all mention this, like, have you ever been here? Right. You know, but we, we, we're tw 20 minutes away from the rest of LA. Right. Everything I mean, is so close. The beach. Right. Yeah, I can get a car and I can go, mm -hmm. you know, go to a beach and be there in 20 minutes. People Top come to visit line. and they're like, <laughs> yeah, people are like, really? Right? Um, trans public transportation. Whereas other places are getting a bus that comes through just in the morning and the afternoon because it's really just for the people that come clean mm -hmm. and work. Man, we got, you go on Crenshaw, there's like seven lines, you know what I mean? There's a, like, we have access, whether it be public transportation, whether it be your own transportation, to be able to connect up with everything we want to connect up right. with. Mm -hmm. um, I think now's a good time to start mm, I know. I'm talking about the food like, and getting into I the step food. Should I step away and bring Farid over here? Um, yeah, okay. please, thank you. <laughs> And, and any type of fruited sweet water is lovely. <laughs> and now we're about to uh, dig into this amazing food, uh, these uh, North African tacos here at Revolutionario. Chef's Eyed. Uh, hey, hello, everyone. Ooh, that right. looks wow. Good. That looks good. <laughs> this looks so amazing. Jerry, just for you, we got a little test of North Africa. Okay? Oh, yes. That's where we are today. Ah, uh, Merguez, he knows, he knows, he knows what I love. Okay, all right, just making sure. T tell us about the food, Chef. Please. Okay, so, um, black happy filifal, it's a bit of a mix between the Middle East and the North Africa because I'm the one who give it uh, the na North African twist by putting uh, the spice mixture from North Africa. Okay. Pretty much all of those dishes have somehow that spice mixture, okay? okay? We have the chickpea tagine, mm. we have the chakchuka, which belong uh, to North Africa, we have the 
de merguez, Richard de beef and lamb uh, sausage. Mm. They do Spicy have a little beef, kick. Lamb. And then we have the uh, cilantro yogurt, uh, no, sorry, the, the preserve the lemon and olive uh, mm. chicken tagine. We have the cauliflower here. Again, ah. they just fry little seasoning, little uh, ras el hanout on top, and then the lentil and the uh, butternut squash tagine. Great. Oh, that man. All we're, I'm just going to, we're going to start digging. I'm going to get some taco for fixings it. and we're going to go Yeah, for we it. have some sauces like the red iris. I'll bring it to you. All right, thank like, you. Like, people don't know how lucky we are to have um, a chef as talented as Chef Zaid bringing all of his talent and focusing it on affordable food. It's amazing. So the pineapple and the yogurt will go great with the, with the black api. The Chachuca can be eaten on its own. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little greenery on the chicken, mm -hmm. but it's up to you. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to keep eating while we... I'm sorry. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> of course. I'm not, I'm not trying to, to stop your flow, my brother. It keeps it real. Exactly. <laughs> Only fake men ignore their tacos. <laughs> um, so... We just smashed this food. I'm telling you, this is so good. Folks, definitely, you don't cheat yourself, right. treat yourself. There you go. Get over to Revolutionario North African Tacos. I, I'm telling you, I was remarking, even if you're vegan, uh, these these things are so big. Right. These Two of these tacos, vegan Pozole tacos. Pozole tacos, um, the fried, uh, fried cauliflower. That is delicious. The black IP falafels. Absolutely fabulous. Um, the uh, smoked duck, the barbacoa, the, 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 the lamb. I mean, it's just... The sausages know, they make themselves right, here. Right, the merguez. They make these, especially French sausages, merguez sausages you can't get anywhere else. They have to make them here because they can't buy them in America, but they're right here at Revolutionario. All right. Delicious. And they were delicious. So, uh, uh, Nana, now that we have, you know, been well fed, so well yes, fed by the yes. restaurant. Um, now we have some fuel in us to do <laughs> the important work that we're doing. Right. Can you tell uh, the audience a little bit about what you and your organization have coming up in the next couple quarters that you think are important or essential that revolve around community justice or whatever else you're getting into? Yes, thank you for that. Um, Justice Warriors for Black Lives is our community collaborative. Our purpose is to equip and deploy black folks and our allies in support of black liberation, especially in what we describe as the legal front line. So we're gonna be doing some what we call Weber Sations. They're on the web, they're conversations, in which we talk about issues critical to our communities that also have some adjacency or intersection with the legal world. So we'll be talking about gentrification, this very topic, and how that intersects with the criminal sanction system and mass incarceration, um, death by gentrification, police killing us because they're in our neighborhoods, because they've been, you know, they've been called on us as we, as you said, the sketchy black. So we're definitely going to um, focus on that. We're gonna to continue to push back against the black identity extremist classification by the FBI, this false flag um, uh, uh, term. And we know that if we can push back with black folks, that'll prevent them from creeping up to everyone else. Cause stress, when it starts happening to black people, they, they spread the hate for sure. So uh, people should go to wearewarriors.com. Um, that is our website. You can go to our Facebook page for Justice Warriors for Black Lives and pick up on that. We have some important trainings coming up. Know your rights training. Folks, you know, you're getting stuff on the internet and I'm looking at it and I'm cringing because the things that are being taught are gonna get you killed. They're gonna get you tased, they're gonna get you beat. So we definitely wanna make sure that people pay attention and uh, look out for our know your rights when you're confronted by the police, our workshops. Um, we also have cards, we call freedom mantra cards. And if folks reach out to us, um, either through our website or through the Facebook page, we'll make sure to get some cards out to you. They give you in four mantras what your rights are. We want you to have that. We want you to share that with the community. Uh, and then we will also, we're open. Folks can contact us if you want us to do trainings as well. Uh, with respect to my Cal State LA Pan-African Studies Department piece, people should look out for our Pan-African Studies Forum. We always have a forum every year. We've had the likes of Angela Davis, um, Erica uh, Huggins. We've had, you know, just Ava DuVernay. We've had a bunch of different people. And this time we have Youssef Salam 
who is one of the Central Park Five. Yes. And so he's going to be coming, talking to us about his experience and sharing with us, because not Yusuf, that many people get that. folks that don't know, Yusuf Salam was uh, uh, in a group of five young black and brown youth of color that Donald Trump publicly called for their execution repeatedly by placing full-page ads in multiple papers in New York City. So if Donald Trump had his way, Yusuf Salam, the worms would have already eaten his body. Right, and then they were able to show years later that, in fact, they were not involved, that their confessions were coerced, because they were juveniles, they were young people, kids at the time. And so he would have killed not just children, but innocent children, right, uh, because of his racism and his venom. And so Yusuf ISIS Salam, oh no, uh-uh. Not here. Not here, yeah. right. So he will be at the Pan-African Studies Forum. We're pleased to announce that he'll be there. And so folks should just look out. Um, you can catch up with me at Attorney Nana. You can go to the show's page. We have a show as well on uh, Pacifica Conversations on the Way, the Asafo edition. So you can go to that page, get information about what we're doing, when we're doing it. We air Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Of course, you can turn your dial or go to kpfk.org, and you can hear us there. Lift the time shift it anywhere on the web, too. That's right. There you go. That's right. Now, I really want to thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you for inviting me. This was lovely. Great company, great food, great, great, company, great conversation. Great come you know, on now. This is the life. Welcome to L.A. I tell my friends in New York, no, it sucks in L.A. Don't, don't come here. Don't come here. There's no good food. There's no good people. Stay in New York. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Keep it all for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank I want to thank you all for joining us today. This is our very first episode of Restaurant Chats, keeping it political, keeps it real. You know how we do. Uh, this is a really great conversation with uh, Susan Park, one of the owners of Revolutionario North African Tacos, and Chef Zaid, uh, her husband. They have fed us incredibly well. You you are stealing from yourself if you don't check this place out you owe it to yourself come on down for a taco uh and um that's it y'all until we come back next month with a new restaurant chat uh just stay tuned on the podcast check us out on the radio um on television i have a new airplane show that i'm doing um it's a private airline and you can't have access to it but know it's out there it'll make you feel good that's it y'all till next chat i'm out i'm out, I'm out, I'm out.